Paisley made Thread, but Thread made Paisley. Um, and that's quite true. Um, Thread was produced in Paisley, 19th, 20th century, and it was a hub for manufacturing of thread. Um, but what happened to the thread? Who used the thread? What did they do with the thread? Um, what skills did they have? Um, what can you see thread was used for? And that's really what Paisley Thread Schools is all about. There is a continuous thread of skills. Um, skill sharing, creativity, well-being, mindfulness, uh, women getting together, having a chat, um, it kind of uh, encourages them, etc. All looking towards the future, which is actually quite bright for um, thread skills, um, that who knows what will happen next with the Renfrewshire Tapestry or more community engagement projects. Um, so that's the story of Paisley Thread Skills, and that's what we're going to look at. What I think is great about Paisley in particular is this connection that you've got between industry and place. And as soon as you step off the station in Paisley, you're hit with this textile heritage. You've got Cotton Street, you've got Gore Street, Silk Street, and it's embedded in its history and it's still there in the architectural landscape. And I think that's something that's just really vibrant and calls back to these skills and all these people that worked in these industries over the last few centuries. There's so many buildings and heritage that comes from those textile industries of the past. You know, even in Paisley, it's the street names. The street names are after fabric and threads and stuff. And the buildings, these buildings of the industry that, that textile brought, you know, Underwood, they had the Underwood Mill as well. You know, there were so many places that have this connection and you can kind of draw them together. And it, it is like that continuous thing of, this is the past, was all these things. We're not going to forget that, and we're going to carry on with this thread of using the threads that we've in the past and making something that's telling the story of present day. Tambour embroidery is a traditional technique in which the stitching is created using a needle or hook. In whitework embroidery, the stitching is the same colour as the foundation fabric, traditionally white thread onto white linen. Thread skills such as tambour embroidery and Ayrshire white work can be thought of as women's needlecraft skills, often home-based and handmade. These, however, are the basis of a forgotten industry in Paisley. In the 18th and 19th century, tambour embroidery and white work were highly fashionable and were produced and marketed on an industrial scale. Often referred to as fancy work or worked muslin, one manufacturer in Paisley was Brown and Sharp. The warehouse was situated at Shuttle Street and Brown's Lane. Both tambour embroidery and white work offer extremely interesting insights into fashion through the first half of the 19th century. The evolution of a seemingly juxtaposing shape and silhouette and the use of different fabrics celebrated these creative techniques. So tambour work embroidery really takes off on a if you like, commercial scale in Scotland in around the 1780s. An Italian manufacturer comes to Edinburgh to start off with, um, but he can't get linen of the quality that he needs to produce tambour work. So he starts to look west and he goes to Paisley and where the cotton manufacturers really start to take off, the fine muslin industry is really starting to pick up pace there. Um, and he sets up tambour workshops where you've got multiple women sitting around one particular frame. Um, and that is linked to fashion in the 1780s and it also provides a foundation for the white work industry in the 19th century. 
Tambo comes from uh, the French word for drum because the light muslins and silk was stretched over a frame to make sure that the little hook tool that was used to make the chain effect didn't catch on the fabric. Um, and it also meant that you could work quite quickly um, and also you could apply things like beading, sequins and new forms of embellishment that weren't necessarily used in previous decades to new fabrics that were popular in style at the time. White work was definitely a cheaper option compared to laces that were being handmade at the time. Um, so it was used in different ways um, and it meant that the market could be widened for things like collars and accessories that people deemed necessary in fashion at the time. So yeah, it opened up access to the white work industry to a wider market. Tambour work, for example, in the 1780s was really benefited from the fact that um, you've got these neoclassical fashions, the, the long white dresses, cotton muslin important to Paisley industry. And tambour work tended to use more colourful threads, so that really popped on the plain white fabric. White work, as the name suggests, is a different form, and it was white thread on white cotton. And it also benefited from changes in fashions, because by the time you get to the 1830s, fashion is, it's, it, women are dressed less like Grecian um, ancient Greeks and there's, that, there's less of that neoclassical look. It's more angular, skirts are bigger, sleeves are bigger, so there's more space that you can display things on. If you could afford it you would get lace and if you couldn't you got white work and that's where white work really takes off in the west of Scotland and it's a way of showing off a particular needlework technique. You've got pulled thread and drawn thread, cut out areas that are filled in with needle point lace and lots of surface stitching. So it's quite decorative, but it's all white thread and white fabric. White work really, really takes off in the early 19th century. So by 1820s, 1830s, and that's when it really becomes a huge industry. It's much bigger than tambour work. It employs thousands of women across the west of Scotland, particularly around Ayrshire. And it's probably more significant than the tambour work industry. Jessie Wiley Newbury, 1864 to 1948, was born in Paisley. She was an artist and embroiderer. She founded the embroidery department at Glasgow School of Art, was a mentor to the Glasgow girls, and was instrumental in the creation and public promotion of the Needlework Development Scheme. She was also an advocate of women's suffrage and was an active member of the Women's Social and Political Union. Post Second World War and uh, the time of austerity in Britain, uh, Coates and Clark, the thread company, promoted um, needlework, um, needlework um, as like um, packs where you got some of their beautiful threads, a pattern you got, and um, a kind of piece of linen um, which was pre-printed with a pattern. And women were encouraged to kind of, it's a kind of womanly accomplishment to be good at sewing. This is a generation of making stuff for yourself in your house to make your house nice. You know, we're talking about the post-war generation who were kind of coming out of rationing we're getting the chance to, to make things look pretty. The 1950s were very much, you know, the sort of prettiness and floral and embroidery and all that sort of stuff about making your surroundings much nicer. I think that, that for me, it, it is one of these skills that when I was a younger, I was like, oh, I didn't want to do that. But I've kind of grown and I really, really enjoy it. And I do see it as a really valuable skill to have. And I think maybe it has been undervalued a bit because it has been mainly women who has been involved in it. But having said that, I read an article the other day and it was talking about Mary Queen of Scots. And Mary Queen of Scots is somebody, I mean, the embroidery that she did that was all full of hidden meanings. And it, so it was political. So you think to yourself, you know, that, that there's more to, historically, there's more to embroidery than what we know. 
The white work industry was very much based on female labour, so it was the women that were doing the sewing and these women and girls would age from anything from seven up to seventy. You would have young children, single women, married women, widowed women, um, thousands of women would get money from this industry. Um, and it was a means for them to, for single women, it, was, it could be a means for them to support themselves, so it was really important from that perspective. Um, but it could also just contribute to the family and household economy. As far as skill goes, yes, it definitely was a skilled occupation. It's thought, one of the commentators in the 19th century, it's thought that um, it would take around three months to train a young girl to the point where she could be able to earn money from producing white work. And when you compare that with, say, an apprentice muslin weaver, which was around six weeks, that's a long time to develop that skill. And when you see the surviving examples of this, you can see how intricate and detailed the stitches are. Um, it definitely was a skilled occupation. There's stories within this of contemporary artists today who use thread skills and textiles to engage with the community. Um, and some of them have even used inspiration from ladies like Jessie Newbery. There's another thing as well which I think is really important to kind of talk about and it's about kind of pictorial, the visual arts and pictorial representation. And there's, there's always been this kind of history of the, the, the kind of drawing and painting being a kind of like higher art form than, than craft work. And I think that's what's important about, about the work of someone like Jessie Newbery who, who was really at the kind of vanguard of that movement to sort of say, look, the decorative arts are as, as valuable as the visual arts. I've always been interested in sort of learning different techniques and but often what I would do is find a little snippet of social history and then learn a technique to tell that story. So this was based on some work I did um, related to Ayrshire white work and you know a lot of christening robes were made and babies bonnets were made with that in the 18th century and people actually people from um, source from Northern Ireland came over as well which sort of ties in with my own background. But I discovered that women used to um, drop a little drop of whiskey in their eyes to stop their um, uh, their eyes when their eyes were strained from sewing for a long time in dark cottages. So I just loved this story, and I was thinking about um, you know people are shocked by it, and there people talk a lot about you know the hardship of cottage industry. But I also was thinking about a group of women sitting together, sharing stories, and also wondering, you know, did the whiskey go in the eyes or did they have a little nip themselves? So I made a series of aprons that had pockets in for your whiskey. And I made a, like a, it was like a bullet belt that, you know, these belts with loads and loads of little bottles all around. And this became, actually it was quite important work for me because I'd been doing so much teaching and it was the first time I got back into my own work again and started developing my own practice I suppose as an exhibiting artist. So I made a lot of work um, but I used different materials um, rather than you know it would have been done on cotton so I made, um, I wanted to be able to see the, the whiskey through it so um, I, I did it onto sort of silk organza and cotton organza and then but I learned the traditional skills and then um, embroidered a series of pieces. I've done some work with Paisley Museum uh, to do with a uh, project called, on, or an exhibition called Uncut Cloth. But Hannah Frew Patterson taught me at art school and she was my embroidery tutor. And so I was really lucky to get, have her for one year before she retired. But I was really keen on doing the embroidery side of the course rather than the weaving. And I remember at the time she taught us, we had to do these samples of embroidery stitches um, experiment and I seem to be the only one that really enjoyed it and got into it. The others thought it was really dull, <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. And I sort of remained friends with Hannah since. So Hannah used to work for Coates, or Coates Threads and from, she was from Paisley. So, and she's now in her late 80s and um, she's uh, been an inspiration to a lot of textile artists. Me and the Figgy Needlers worked together to collaborate on a, on a banner. And there was this whole thing around um, the banner as historically this kind of really sort of resonant or political object. And so trying to figure out like how we could represent Fergusley and Fergusley women within this kind of, within this space or within this surface was, was really interesting. And what we ended up doing was um, 
Um, like I, I was, I was kind of observing that when the when the fig needlers got together, we'd, they would, we would sit, we would sit at a table in a circle and really talk and really lean into each other and be really like, I remember and this and that. And I took a photograph um, of four women from the back, and that became the key image on our banner. Was just this sense of like chatting and being effective through dialogue and through conversation. And then, and then we were going like, what? So what? What? What's the slogan? What are we saying? And, and one of the things that we we realised about the processions was that they were celebrating 100 years of women getting the vote, but it was only middle class women with property who'd had the vote for 100 years. Working class women didn't get the vote for another 10 years. So we kind of made our, our banner about that, about the fact that it's only 90 years for us. <laughs> it's not 100. Also, we used the banner as a way to kind of really um, identify women from Fig women from Fergusley, Fiji woman, and our slogan ended up being Fiji woman with a breedy of rain. Do you know what I mean? So it's basically saying if you come from Fiji, you're unique. In 2019, artist Mandy McIntosh and participating makers from the Star Project Paisley presented an exhibition of stitched textile artworks inspired by research into the life and works of Paisley-born artist and embroiderer Jesse Wiley Newbery. Working on that Star Project about Jesse Newbery, what I found, the, the project wasn't kind of um, sort of described to a group as a, as a sewing project, it was described as a kind of heritage sort of art project. The work that was made within that community project was really diverse. It was very, lots of kind of very different approaches and different formats, which I really liked. Um, because again, it's kind of going back to what I learned with Mrs Winters in, in, in secondary school, which is that you stitching is, is like the kind of Bauhaus idea of taking a line for a walk. You know, it's not domestic, it's, it can be really radical and it's important to really sort of hold on to that. The Renfrewshire Tapestry is a community project to create a new tapestry telling the story of Renfrewshire, similar to the Great Tapestry of Scotland. The Renfrewshire Tapestry, they, they have the teardrops, which is, um, that's an aspect of community engagement. You know, that you can make a donation by buying a little kit it's a teardrop shape and you embroider it with whatever design you want. You design the design yourself. It's a story that you want to add to. You can stitch it yourself or one of the volunteers will stitch it for you. Um, and that's a great way of actually saying, I'm part of Renfrewshire's story. I'm part of the tapestry. Sometimes some people come in and they say, oh no, I can't do that. I can't do that. And you say, well, just go easy on yourself and just start and it's just like having a wee bit confidence and I think it's boosted my confidence quite a lot. And somebody might come to us and go I've got a story and I want to tell it and that to me can always be turned into thread and fabric and as long as there's thread and fabric we can keep telling stories. See, every stitch, every stitch will tell a story, but it's hidden. We'll never know what's behind that stitch because I've met lots of people that have stitched into the tapestry and done their teardrops, and you just don't know if they've been in pain, mentally or physically. During lockdown, I worked for a long, long time on this tapestry. Different stitches were used to create the texture and prominence, making the colour stand out. Stitching is so therapeutic and extremely worthwhile. I found while I was doing this that it took my mind off all the other things that are happening in my life, and some of them aren't pleasant. So um, it really did help. And although it took a long, long time to, to do this tapestry, that's what kept me going. Because the more I was doing, the more I wanted to see it finished, the more I wanted to outline something or just use another strand, do something different. And it really made such a difference to my life. I'm glad now that I've managed to finish it. 
and I thoroughly enjoyed stitching this whole tapestry, watching the design come out and the colours used to depict this historical occasion. It's an important way of switching your brain off and going. The rhythmic movement of the thread moving in and out through the fabric is such an important way of just getting your brain to sort of slow down and stop. And you're concentrating so hard on the thread and making your stitches that you can just block out everything that's happening and just clear your mind. Somehow through, through needlework, people are, are kind of more at ease, are more comfortable in creating, you know, pictures or imagery through that format rather than saying, oh, stand in front of this easel and kind of do a portrait because it's intimidating. For me, creativity is still um, intergenerational and um, the ways that we share skills as individuals and welcome people kind of to being connected to creativity in textiles is really exciting and people still today use it for expressing various different things. So identity through making clothing or banners for marches and sharing their voice on things that are really important to them. Um, and for me, I definitely connect with both of those ideas, so skill sharing and ex self-expression. Quite an important aspect of stitching and textiles that, that, that people can do it in groups and it's really portable. I think that's a really important thing. It's something that you can just put in your bag and carry about with you. Um, and I think the, port the portability thing is really, really important because because the fact that you can pick something up and put it down and take it away and bring it back, it's not that you're tied to like a big massive piece of machinery or equipment. You know, we weave in. Weaving is really different because you've got a loom, even if you're doing tapestry weaving, you've still got a frame, you've still got something that's quite big, whereas knitting is really, you know. My granny was, you know, really good at making and my aunt as well. And my mum, you know, I was sort of of a generation where you know, my mum knit our jumpers. She made our dresses when we were growing up. But I've always made things. You know, I don't remember not making things, you know, growing up. And also, I and I remember getting um, Santa one year gave us um, fabric and thread as part of our, you know, that was at the end of the bed, Santa Claus. So I think it was just part of sort of, you know, part of growing up, really. I think the thing that this kind of rings throughout Paisley's textile history for me is the fact that so many different people were involved in it in lots of different ways, in lots of different textiles. Obviously the Paisley shawl, one of which I have behind me, um, it's really remembered, um, but the, the people who made it are often slightly overlooked in the way that they um, work together in the way that they kind of hone their craft and skills and that thread runs through all of Paisley's textiles really is the people who were making it and that history really needs to come to the fore. People are realising that they have to have some of these skills like you know we're going to have to repair things more well you know if you want to be eco-conscious you know we have to we have to think about the Rather than just continually buying clothes and cheap clothes, we buy things you know that will last or that we can repair if we can afford it, of course. But you know, so I think I would hope the skills that you know I've taught children in schools or community groups will carry on in some way. I think the the focus now on kind of archives and opening archives up to the public is a really really important thing to have pieces kind of out in front of you that you can actually look at it's a really important thing and I think that the more we kind of the more public we can create these resources the better. I think that there's quite an important legacy for the project I think everybody kept telling us at the start oh people don't do need to work anymore it's not a thing and I was like well I think it is actually um, and actually that's one of the things we've demonstrated with this there's an eagerness to learn from people people want to do it and it's a benefit to them. These legacies are 
are, are, are essential for understanding where Scotland has come from, where Scotland's society has come from. Scotland's part in terms of um, Scotland's role within British history, wider British history, European and global history and textiles are the perfect way to consider all of those angles because they are literally embedded in every single layer of everybody's lives.